in five, four, three. And welcome inside Delaware Live Sports. Nick Alessandrini now joined by Jason Winchell, Glenn Frazier, and Mike Lang. It is the eve of Final Four action here in the state of Delaware as we have our Final Four teams, both the girls and the boys brackets now. It's championship week as, again, the girls will be played tomorrow evening and the boys Final Four Thursday evening and Friday and Saturday as we continue into the championship. So, guys, just to get started, Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yeah, Pretty good group, of ga- group, group, good group of games. Glenn, how you doing today? You had a good one last night. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we had the, uh, the close game. We picked a good one with Woodbridge and Caravel. So, uh, didn't I slept well last night. I, you know, it was the second ball game start to finish. Yeah, Mike, me and you had a chance to beat Ursuline in Charter last night. Ursuline taking care of business. They looked good. How you doing today? I'm doing good. I tell you what, we may have had the best atmosphere. Uh, oh, it was, it was wild outstanding uh just a great great host and um you know great atmosphere and, and it was a lot of fun and uh happy for charter that they were able to get that far uh, it's a shame that, that one of them had to lose last night so now let's dive into first our girls bracket for this year obviously we have our final four teams it is set it's caravel tattnall samford and ursland and we'll dive into how they got there and some matchups here in just a little bit but let's just start with the overall recap so far of the girls' bracket. And, Jay, we'll start with you here. It, it's been a fun one so far, some big matchups. We saw Charter and St. Mark's have a huge one that, with Charter getting the two-point win, some very close games throughout here. Um, is there any surprise teams or surprise wins from early on in that tournament that really caught you off guard? Um, not really. The girls was more – Chalk than than the boys definitely, uh, you know, and you know a couple of upsets. Kate Penlope and over, over Delmar with Christian. I think Kate, you know, if you looked on paper, was a better team. Um, so you know, it's probably gone as as uh, you know as planned. Um, and uh, you know, one team I think I don't know if they surprised me was AI Dupont. Um, you know, they end up losing to Tattnall. And I got a chance to talk to their coach last night. He was at the St. E's game. And, you know, he said he was very disappointed after the loss. And then he saw how the way they came out, uh, Tattnall came out and play, uh, played in the first half against St. Elizabeth and goes, you know, right now they, they look like they're the team to beat right now. And, uh, you know, so maybe he went out against a, a good foe. But uh, I think A.I. DuPont, for not having a team last year, uh, you know, really made a step in the right direction, and I think they will get better uh, as uh, coach, you know, gets those kids coming in. Yeah, Mike, over to you now. Um, anything caught you? Any any surprises to the girls' tournament as we now advance to the Final Four? Yeah, the big surprise for me was uh, friends over St. George's. I thought it would be competitive because uh, St. George's was missing one of their uh, key players. But that's a good win for uh, Coach Connors. It's their last season, so good to see them win a conference uh, or a, a tournament game. And um, I was a little surprised last night, not that Tattnall won, but I was surprised at how they won. They just completely dominated St. Elizabeth's from top to bottom. And, uh, you know, they're, they are, they're clicking right now, and then and they're going to be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, they certainly are. So let's now dive into some of these matchups and get into this Final Four now here, Glenn, you had a good one last night. Caravel in Woodbridge, a trip to the Final Four, a trip to the Bob Carpenter Center on the line. Woodbridge coming in as the nine seed. They get wins over Conrad and Lake Forest to set up this matchup. And, Glenn, you were there uh, right there courtside in Woodbridge, giving Caravel a run for their money last night. Well, they sure did. Uh, you didn't ask me, but I think that would be my surprise game of the whole bracket because it was as close as it was throughout. Um, and I think traditionally, at least over the, the last 10 years that I've watched uh, high school basketball, the girls' bracket has always been closer to chalk than the boys uh, d- due to the dominance of, of uh, the Newcastle County upstate uh, private schools. Um, but the programs are just so solid and they have been traditionally. And uh, typically, um, they're more chalk, as, as we see the issue with one, two, five, and six. But last night, um, 
I mean, Caravelle, they've been to, what, three straight title games, but they got a severe test from uh, the ninth seed Blue Raiders. Uh, Woodbridge never had the lead. They managed to force a couple of ties. They cut the deficit to one possession on ten different occasions. And the last one came with about four and a half minutes to go in the ball game. But it was obvious that the length and height advantage of uh, Carabelle was just too much for the Blue Raiders to overcome in the game. I mean, you got Deanna Gale at 6'2", Wilson's is 5'11", uh, the reigning player of the year, India Johnston, 5'8". They're a formidable trio. But uh, we were talking before we came on the air, they really need to do a better job of finishing at the rim against Tattnall. They have the edge against Tattnall and experience, as this is the first Final Four in school history for the Hornets. But uh, it, it should be a very interesting game there. Caravelle trying to get to their fourth straight title game, and uh, Tattnall trying to get there for the first time ever. But, yeah, great game last night. Um, a lot of hustle, great guard defense and pressure defense out of uh, Woodbridge with uh, Peyton Keeler and Mims and uh, Reagan Robinson. But, uh, once again, they were out, man. It was, I was surprised that they kept in the game as long as they did and was very impressive the way they did it. Man, again, a team to look out for. Again, Woodbridge, what a season they've had down there. I mean, undefeated for a large part of the beginning of that season and obviously getting the nine seed and giving Caravelle a big run last night. Jay, a team... You know, that I believe you picked them in our pregame show to make the Final Four. You were present last night for Tattnall and St. Elizabeth's, a four versus number five. Um, again, going into that one, maybe one of the best matchups of the night you would have imagined heading in, but Tattnall looking really good, and they get a big win over St. E's, the defending state champs. Yeah, and it was over uh, from opening tip. Uh, Tattnall scored early and often in the first quarter, ran out to a 15-0 lead. Uh, led 16 to two at the end of the quarter, and never looked back. Uh, you know what they did? Uh, Saintes shot from the outside. That the height of Tatnell pestered Saintes. Everything was from the outside, and it was one and done. And Tatnell took care of the ball and ran their offense. They they run a, a lot of backdoor cuts, a lot of uh, plays uh, to get the Kirby sisters. But if you haven't seen their point guard yet. Uh, she was spectacular. Uh, St. E's is a team that builds themselves on pressure, builds themselves on turning you, you over, and Tattnall just did not turn it over much last night. They did, but not as much as St. E's wanted. And, uh, you know, that was the difference in the game. But they, like I said, from opening tip, uh, if you hold St. E's to one shot per possession, you know, chances are you're going to win. Um, and, like I said, St. E's did not hit one three-pointer. Wow. Uh, all night long, and, and that's their bread and butter. They just, uh, but it was due to the pressure defense of Tattnall, and then, like I said, one re one shot, and they would grab the defensive rebound, Tattnall. 17 points last night for Emma Kirby. Obviously, she's having a fantastic season. We had a chance to check her out at the Diamond State, Mike, and, and you've been talking about the Kirby sisters all year as well. You've seen Tattnall. Talk a little bit about the Hornets in, in your perspective. They're not deep, but, uh, you know, you can win with uh, seven players. And, you know, Emma and, and her sister, Sophie, it's, it's amazing. Emma, as, as tall as she is, she's really, uh, you know, she's, she's got a shot. Sophie's a three-point shooter, believe it or not. She's like six one. Um, you know, Jason mentioned the, the guard play with Karis Bryant and Callie Clayton. Uh, they're just really good. And then Brie Gauthier is kind of a glue person for that team. And, and we said they don't go very deep. I think Jordan Sell was the only other scorer they had last night. Uh, so they had the five starters and, and Jordan. Um, they don't make mistakes. You know, they're really solid. And when you have the, the Twin Towers like that, it makes it, like it's like Glenn was saying, to get them inside and finish is going to be difficult with those two the sisters standing there. I think uh, people have not seen Tadmo. I know there's a lot of people have not seen them. They're in for a treat tomorrow night. And again, these two teams met back in early January, January 4th, a 46-45 win for Caravelle over Tattnall at Caravelle Academy. It's going to be a neutral site for this Final Four match, of course, at the University of Delaware. This one at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. So now let's dive in a little bit to that matchup here quickly, Caravelle and Tattnall. Glenn, you talked a little bit about a big key for the Bucks heading into this one. What's your keys to the game for Caravelle and Tattnall? 
Well, I I think it's uh, what I mentioned, mm-hmm. what happened last night in the bridge when uh, Caravel has got to finish around the rim. Um, they had a really good test with uh, defensive guard pressure on them last night, and I think that's going to be uh, some good experience for them. I think the key is caravel has been there. This team, again, is making uh, their fourth consecutive deep run in the tournament. So they have the experience over Tattnall, but, but they need to finish. And, and by the way, I didn't mention <laughs> Woodbridge last night. They only dressed eight players. Wow. And they have no seniors on that roster. They're all back next year. Definitely keep an eye out for the Woodbridge Blue Raiders. Jason, your keys to the game for Caravelle and Tattnall. Yeah, one thing Tattnall's going to have to do is they're going to have to uh, you know, try and slow the reigning player of the year down, and that's not an easy task to do. Um, but they did it last night. They, they s- slowed Rory uh, down for St. Elizabeth's, and um, Huggins, they, they kept off the boards. Uh, and that's what they're going to have to do against Caravel uh, to do it. And I, uh, I'm with Glenno. I think that experience factor might play a key into this game, a team that's been there, played at the Bob before. Uh, I know it hasn't been there in a couple of years, so some of these players might not have. But they've been in these deep runs, and Tattnall's making their first ever trip to the semifinals. Uh, but I can tell you what, I was there last night. That was one excited group. They were hugging. Uh, high fiving the coaches, the the whole that Tattnall brought a crowd last night for a small school. Uh, they will bring it, uh, and the, it will be a fun atmosphere in the Bob on Wednesday night. Mike, closing words here: Caravel and Tattnall should be a great matchup, six thirty p.m. tomorrow night. Yeah, I think the key's going to be Janai Gale uh, down low and Taylor Wilkins, but more Gale inside. She's only been back for uh, a month or so with. But she knows the school and knows the program. But I'm interested to see uh, Janiah Gale against um, Emma Kirby down low. I think that could be a real big key. And like uh, Glenn mentioned and Jason mentioned, Caravel is used to that atmosphere. Maybe that gives them a slight advantage, but it, it should be. I think that's going to be a great game. Again, that's your first one Wednesday night at the Bob Carpenter Center. Caravel and Tattnall, your number one seed versus your number four seed. Or excuse me, five seed. Obviously, he's the four. Now let's head over to our other final four matchup, and it starts with the two seed, Sanford, a team that's been atop our rankings for a while at Delaware Live Sports. They get a win over Archmere after that first round bye. They win by 33, and then they have another big win last night over Cape Henlopen, the second time they've taken down the Vikings this year to find themselves back at the Bob Carpenter Center. And Jason Sanford has been taking care of business all season long. They've won by double digits, large margins each of the first two games here in the tournament. And now they're going to have a matchup with Ursuline, who we'll get to in a second. They had a big win over the Charter School of Wilmington. But what has made Sanford so dangerous this year? Uh, They're one of the complete teams in the state. I mean, they they come at you, and they have five different players that easily score double figures. Uh, They play great defense. They don't give up much. Uh, Good, tough team uh, will hit the, the rebound like Tattnall did. Uh, you know, their closest games of the year were against that Tattnall, Tat- Tattnall yeah. program. Um, and, and I think Arsenal lost by 12, I think, in the regular season to Sanford. Uh, so they're, they were probably their closest three games all year uh, for in-state teams. But, you know, each night it could be a different person for Sanford, uh, you know, as their leading scorer. And they're very balanced. They aren't very deep, but there's six or seven players that play all can score in double figures easily. Yeah, they're very sound. It's just to check them out. They've looked really good this year. And as you mentioned, Jay, all aspects of the game, they can do it all. And, Mike, you've seen them a few times as well. Um, should be a good one as the second matchup tomorrow night against Ursuline. But let's now head over to Ursuline, the team <clears throat> excuse me, that you had the chance to check out last night. And they were also firing on all cylinders. What a crowd they brought to Wilmington Charter. And they hit seven big threes and also out-rebounded the force last night on their way to victory. Yeah, Nick, uh, you know, we called the game, and I think that they really set it up with their defense, and they're, they're known for their defense. They they absolutely smoked Charter on the boards. They caused a ton of turnovers, and they were hitting the three-point shots, and it was, uh, you know, it was lights out uh, in, in the second quarter. Um, you know, they 
that's what Coach Newton's teams are, are known for is that pressure D. The thing with Stanford is they have the experience to, to handle that kind of stuff. So we'll see if they can, uh, if Ursuline can stay with Stanford offensively uh, tomorrow night. You did, Jason mentioned they lost by 12 in the regular season. Um, they were they were like a lot of teams hang with Stanford for a while, and then the Warriors kind of put them away with a little bit of a run in that game. Um, so it should be uh, should be fun. I think it's it's interesting that all four of these teams that are in uh, are on the smaller side, but I think it's going to be kind of loud inside that building tomorrow night anyway. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Both of these final four matchups, obviously rematches, as we have alluded to here so far. Um, during this episode. And Glenn, have you had a chance to check out Sanford or Ursuline at all this year? I have not, but uh, you, you got to like the way this thing is setting up, right? Because you got Ursuline and Sanford in one semifinal, the two Blue Bloods. Uh, Ursuline with what, 17, I think 17 state titles, and Sanford has five. They're no strangers to each other in the state tournament. So that, that's a, a really big rivalry matchup there. And then in the other semifinal, Tattnall, which has never been this far before, and then Caravel, which has never won a state championship. So I think it just sets up to be a really interesting and intriguing uh, Final Four on the girls' side. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And how about that coaching matchup? Obviously, Coach Thompson versus Coach Noonan in that Ursuline Sanford matchup. We've talked to Kristen Caldwell. Her and Paul Smith will obviously be going at it in the first matchup. She's done such a great job at Caravel. Coach Smith over at Tattnall. I mean, it's just great coaching matchups all around here in the Final Four as well, Jason. Uh, you have any keys to the game for Sanford and Ursuline? Yeah, I think uh, Ursuline has to hit their threes uh, to have any chance in this. Um, you know, they're a great three-point shooting team, uh, but you know, another thing key is going to be defense. Both these teams play solid defense. It'll be interesting to see which team forces the most turnovers and capitalizes on them. So I think that could be an interesting key. But um, I think Ursuline has to hit some three-pointers because I think that will keep them in the game if they can. Mike, over to you. Keys to the game for Sanford and Ursuline. Uh, Ursuline, the one thing they've had uh... – that Coach Noonan says is he is uh, his point guard play. You know, it's been a few years since he had a real true point guard. So keeping possession of the ball, I think, is important. Uh, obviously, that three point shooting is going to be important. Um, and just playing smart, solid defense for Ursuline. Uh, you know, they can't get into foul trouble. They just they they just can't. I mean, uh, Stanford will will put you away in a hurry. Uh, for Sanford, you, just gotta, you can't get complacent and say, hey, we beat these guys by 12 in the regular season. Uh, you got to just don't look forward to, to Friday night. Just you know, concentrate on Friday, I mean on Wednesday, and get through that first and then worry about a rematch with Tattnall or, or with uh, Caraval. They played both of them. Should be some, some good Final Four matchups. And, again, we don't pick champions here at Delaware Live Sports, but we do pick championship games. So we'll do final four picks here quickly. Um, we'll do for the first one, Caravel and Tattle, or should we wait till the end of the show to do our picks? Yeah, let's do the girls now. Yeah, let's do it, girls now. We're, we're on the about. subject. Caravel and Tattle. De- Jay, we'll start with you. Winner and why? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, yeah, you, yeah, I get the the first crack. I ran, I have run the Tattle bandwagon. All year, That's I checked true. them against St. E's, and I, and I heard about it. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, so I, I'll, I'll pick Tattnall. Uh, and, and and this game, I think, has a potential to go uh, bonus basketball. Oh, uh, but I I see. I like. Uh, I'll I'll go Tattnall in that one. There you go, Tattnall, your winner. Glenn, over to you. We'll start with the other game for you, Glenn. Well, now let's just stick with it. Why well, try to switch up? Caravel, Tattnall, Glenn. <laughs> what do you got there? I love how you go with Jay first. You did that to him in football, too. And he always gets uh, a little upset about that, but it's all in good fun. Uh, yeah, I'm with, I'm with uh, Jay. It, I think this game has the potential to be real tight and could go bonus. The other game, and I'll save that for, for just a moment, I don't think has that, uh, that possibility coming up. Um, well, he took Tatno. I'm going to take Caraval. There you go. I think Caraval might have learned something last night in that 
tight game with Woodbridge. And, uh, again, I think the experience factor of uh, some of those girls already being in that situation uh, will uh, be a key for them in the game. So I'm going to go with Caravelle on a tight one. Jay Tadnell, Glenn Caravelle. And, again, I, this is none of this is really scripted. We I like to keep these guys on their toes with picks and matchups <laughs> and subjects. So just for everyone out there listening, yeah, this is this is – off the cusp for the most part. So, Mike, now over to you. Caravel and Tadnell, you're the, you're the uh, grudge winner here. You're going to pick which side Delaware Live Sports leans to with the with it all tied up 1-1. Yeah, I'm going to go with Brandywine. <laughs> I think, uh, am I allowed to do that? Uh, Not on this you know, show. I'm going to lose friends over this. Uh, you know, the Kirby sisters are friends of mine. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm going to mean with the experience. I, I kind of like Caravelle, although Tadnell's so red hot. Uh, I would not be surprised if it goes the other way. So I'm trying to hedge here. But uh, if, if if I had to pick one, I'm going to pick the experience and the player of the year, uh, last year's player of the year. Uh, and I'll stay with uh, Caravelle. There you have it. And now let's jump to the other Final Four matchup. Sanford, your two seed. They get the six seed, the Ursuline Red Raiders. Both teams have taken care of business up to this point in double-digit fashion for the most part. These two teams did meet. We talked about the first time a win by 12 for Sanford. I believe it was 36 or 38-26, something along those lines. Mike, we'll start with you this time. Or you know what, Glenn, you kind of prefaced this earlier. We're going to start with Glenn here for Sanford and Ursuline. Glenn, both of these teams have been not really challenged so far in the tournament. How do you see this one going? Well, again, I refer to these two as the Blue Bloods, and uh, Ursuline has won more state championships than any other girls' program, and they've won a few against the, the Sanford uh, program over the years. Um, I think this is Sanford's turn. Uh, from what I've heard, I haven't seen them this year. What I've, Everybody's told me, I, I've, you know, I have some friends that are officials that have done the games, that Sanford is the team to beat this year in the girls' tournament, so I'm going to go with Sanford. Mike, over to you. Sanford and Ursuline, you've had a chance to check them both out multiple times. Ursuline, last night, are they fresh in your mind here? Can they maybe pull off the upset? Uh, you know, just to uh, keep things fresh here, I'm going to I'm gonna go with one upset here. I'm going to take the Ursuline Raiders. Wow, uh, there we have, go. They have to play a perfect game, but I think uh, – I, I'll go with Ursula. Let me just say that. And, and they could. I'd say if they play the way they played last night, they didn't turn the ball over a lot. They played good defense, active hands. They hit the threes, and they rebound the basketball. All five of those starters were crashing the boards, able to get rebounds. Jordan Tate, a huge game on the glass for her. It's going to be interesting to see Jordan Tate matched up against some of those Sanford post players who do a good job on the glass as well. Jay, over to you, Ursula and Sanford in the second matchup of our Final Four Wednesday night. Yeah, I just I just think Sanford um, is the team to beat this year, like Glenn said, and I think they're just have a little bit more than Ursuline. So I'll take the Warriors. So I have an all independent conference final. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Big matchups Wednesday for the girls. Caravelle and Tadnell. Sanford and Ursuline. Winners will meet at the championship on Friday night at the Bob Carpenter Center. And again, do not forget, we will have your Final Four pregame show tomorrow night before all this gets started. And now let's jump over to our boys' bracket. What a fun year it has been in the boys' side of things here in basketball in the state of Delaware this year. We talk about the parody all the time and you know, the tournament, we talked about how good it would be, and it's lived up to those expectations. So many close games, but we have our final four set, guys. It's your top seed, Salais Anum. They get a win in overtime over a fantastic Dover team. Howard, your four seed, gets revenge on a loss to Sanford earlier in the year. They beat them 46-41. Seaford has been putting on an absolute show since the beginning of this tournament. Glenn, we'll talk to you in a little bit about them and how much talent they have. A 70-46 to win over St. Andrews, and St. Andrews, what a tournament they had as well. We'll talk about them in a minute. And then Tower Hill advancing with a quadruple overtime win over St. Mark's. What a game that was as well. It finds the Hillers in the final four. So number one, Sally's, number four, Howard, number 10, Seaford, and number three, Tower Hill. Your final four is set for this week. And let's dive right in first. We'll talk about the matchup with Sally's and Dover 
Jay, let's start with you for this one. We all had a chance to be there. Glenn was down at Seaford with, or excuse me, down at Seaford. We'll talk about that one in a moment as well. But overtime, some bonus basketball on Saturday. And Dover, they got the nine seed, but they didn't play like a nine seed. So much talent. We talked about how good they've been all year and what a matchup that was with Sally's pulling it out in OT. Yeah, that was uh, one of the best games I think I've seen all year. Uh, you know, two great teams going at it. Um, and, and what an atmosphere. Dover brought a great crowd up to Sally. Oh, yeah. Sally's student section is insane. The atmosphere was there. You know, for a while, Dover actually had that lead in the second quarter, and they, and they run by Sally's right before the half. Henson hit that big three, and it carried over into the uh, third quarter, and Sally's ended up going up by double digits. And then Dover chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. And held Slaziana to five points in the in the fourth quarter and, and got was able to crawl back in it. Uh, but they just couldn't finish in overtime. Uh, Sally's did a good job defensively on them, held them to Dover to two points in overtime. Um, and kind of swung the momentum back to them. And, and then Mullen hit, hits that big three, um, you know, are you, do you want to talk about it? Are we going to talk about it? It could have been a double dribble. Um, <laughs> it wasn't called. Um, there was a lot of close calls in that game. There were a lot of close so, calls, and I didn't see and, that and, one during the broadcast. And I was right in front of the ref, and he immediately went right away that the defender swiped at it. I couldn't tell if the defender caught any of the ball or not. Um, so, you know, that was the call on the, on the court. It stood, and... You know, Sally's hit the free throws down the stretch and were able to, to, to hold off. But, I mean, I'll tell you what, that quarterfinal game had everything. Uh, the atmosphere was just electric in there. I, was, I would love to see – I'm, I'm a tourist, and I love to see. I would love to see quarterfinal games at neutral sites going Agreed. forward. Yeah, we would love that. Mike, you were there as well for that Sally's Dover game. What did Sally show you on Saturday night or Saturday afternoon? Well, uh, Jason mentioned the, the five-point – fourth quarter and you know, obviously that they, they didn't get down and you can't get down you have to keep going and um in the overtime they they fell behind in the overtime at dover scored early and um you know they didn't panic they got a lot of uh, veterans on that team and a lot of uh you know, obviously some great coaches there um so it was good to see them you know not get all frazzled and, and mullen hit that three and uh you know it's it's lights out, and let's move on to the Bob. Um, so yeah, they, they showed they showed some uh, some poise and, and they got the job done. Yeah, I thought they dealt with adversity well in that one. Dover again brought a nice crowd, and they were up in the you know they, it was a little bit of a chippy game too. Obviously, with what was on the line, both teams played very well. Glenn, you have a chance to see Dover a few times this year, as well as Salazian. I'm not sure if you had to go back and check any of that game out. Um, but you see Salas gets the win in overtime. Just talk a little bit about that matchup. Yeah, I've seen them both a couple of times this year, and uh, I'm with Jay, and I think Mike is, is probably agree with this as well. Um, it is so much fun when they had that quarterfinal round for the boys and the girls at the Bob, and it's a shame that uh, that couldn't be done again. Uh, and if not the Bob, why not the Chase Center? In Wilmington, I don't know how the finances work that, but I think that would have been fantastic. Listen, Salesianum is one of the toughest places to win in for anybody, and we saw that uh, last year in the semifinals when uh, Smyrna went up there with a fantastic team and they miraculously pulled out a win. It was tough. Yeah. It was very tough and a, and a great game in that semi, and then here you had a great one in the quarterfinals with Dover. It would have been great to see that on a neutral court. It would have even been probably greater to see that in a semi or a championship game. Those two are good enough to be in the semis or the championship game. But because the Henlopen North was so top-heavy this year and the bottom teams were so bad, the points worked against Dover and it pushed them down to that nine seed. It was a great game. I went back and I watched it. Uh, for my money, Justin Molin is one of the best clutch players in the state. I mean, that shot that he hit, I mean, that basically that was the ball game. If the game's on the line and it's late in the game, Justin Mullen is just about one of the best players to have the ball in his hands. And Jaheim Harrell did all he could to try to keep Dover in the game. They have a couple of uh, other uh, 
role players like Rainford and Tolson and Amir Height, who can hit from the outside. Solid performance by Dover this year, but uh, they catch a really good team too early in the tournament. Yeah, Sally's, yeah, they were rolling again. One of the teams we had, even with that tough start to the season due to the out-of-state record, we always had them up there in the top couple spots in the top five. Glenn, let's shift focus here to another matchup before we dive into the final four breakdown here. Seaford, they went up against St. Andrews in a perfect world of quarterfinals. It would have been Seaford Caravel in a 10-2 matchup. They get St. Andrews, who went on the road and took down the two-seed, the Buccaneers, by 10, 61-51, and then they had to go to Seaford on Saturday, and Seaford kind of picked up where they left off against Apoquinimic. Yeah, St. Andrews, I mean, I give them credit. Um, Brandon Graves really could not get on track in that game at all, and he's probably one of the best players on that team. Every time he got the ball down in the paint, Seaford collapsed on him with a double or a triple team, and then the guards... Uh, got out on the shooter and uh, Koblish and uh, the point guard, uh, Jay Kelly. Seifert had a great game plan, and they did it without Tyrese Fortune for the second game in a row, arguably uh, the best player on their team and, and the senior leader and, and their leading scorer. I would say it was about midway through the second quarter, Seifert was starting to run away with it. They were pushing their pace. They had a double-digit lead, about 15 points. And then St. Andrews, in the final three minutes of the half, goes on an 8-0 run to make the game manageable going, coming out of the locker room. But Seifert goes on a big run. I think it was like a 14-3 run to start out the third quarter. And it, the game was over. St. Andrews could not get back into the ball game. Seifert uh, did a great job of uh, distributing the basketball. They were very unselfish. Uh, Ricketts and... Uh, Wise did a great job of finding their teammates underneath, cutting to the basket. Seaford, from my money right now, is one of the best teams and maybe the hottest team in the state. And they're going to be a tough out in the semis. This is this is when you want to be playing your best basketball, and Seaford is certainly doing that. Seventy to forty six over St. Andrews in that quarterfinal matchup. Mike, you were there at Tower Hill for a crazy matchup, to say the least, between the Hillers and the Spartans. St. Mark's trying to ride that train, the 22 seed, picking up wins over St. E's in round one. William Penn, the sixth seed in round two. They're going to go on the road for the third straight time, trying to beat a top three team in Tower Hill. And that game went to four overtimes. What a matchup that was. Yeah, first, I want to make something clear. I do not agree with hosting that game at Tower Hill. That said... They did a great job staging that game. They did everything they could in there, and I want to congratulate the people at Tower Hill for making that as great an atmosphere as they did. I just want to make that absolutely clear. This is uh, it, was, it was fun in there. They got teams or fans from both teams. They had as many students as they could get. Mm -hmm. They did a, the people at Tower Hill did a great job, and I, I I don't want them to think that I'm upset at Tower Hill because I'm not. This is this was not their their choice to host that game there. Um, although, and they, they earned it. That was the rule this year. So there. As for the game itself, uh, you know, when you have four overtimes and the winning team only gets 43 points, um, it had a lot of excitement for a game that didn't have a lot of scoring. There was a lot of drama. You know, there was uh, a last-second bucket by Jabri White in the one overtime to get St. Marsh. There was a last-second bucket by, I believe, Dylan Shepard in another overtime to send it to the fourth. And then Dylan Shepard hit a, uh, a game winner uh, from about 14 feet in that fourth overtime, and St. Marshall only had one second. They did get a shot off, but Dylan Shepard blocked the shot at the other end that Gavin Marsh took, and it was a, it was a great atmosphere in there. And, um, and congratulations to Tower Hill. We all thought maybe last year would have been the year that they, uh, they cracked through, um, but instead, you know, this is going to be their, their shot, although they are playing, as Glenn said, they're playing the hottest team in the state right now, but uh, they did a good job. Davis Bland was, did not shoot very well, but they managed to overcome. And I think Dylan Shepard really showed, uh, you know, that, uh, what a key piece he is for, uh, for the Hillers. So congratulations to uh, Coach Kaiser and, and the Hillers. And, and they certainly earned that trip over a very game St. Mark's uh, club. That was a different team, and it was underseeded at number 22, and we all know why. Um, and they did what they had to do to, to get there, and, and they very easily could have won that game on Saturday. 
Yeah, I'm with you, Mike. What a job Coach Lonnie Wright has done <clears throat> with that St. Mark's program this year. We got a chance to talk to him. I did before the season started, and as Nick Holiday reminded me uh, on Saturday, he said they were going to do big things, and they certainly did in year one under head coach Lonnie Wright. 22 seed, picking up wins over St. E's, 11 seed, William Penn, the 16. And as you mentioned, Mike, uh, just a few, maybe, you know, a few moments away from heading to the Final Four. What an accomplishment that would have been, but a great year for the Spartans and Jay, a 43-41 win for Tower Hill. It only took four overtimes. Do we need a shot clock here in Delaware, Jay? Uh, yes, especially the, the overtimes. Uh, the first overtime, Tower Hill held it for the first three minutes. Yes, they did. And then St. Mark's got it for the last minute. And they each scored. So that and they, they each scored. So that was the two points each. Then in the second overtime, St. Mark's held it for two and a half minutes. Didn't score. Tower Hill had it for the other minute and a half. No scoring. So yes, it 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 uh, it was hard to watch. Uh, like Mike said, the excitement was there and it was a really close game. But it it's just hard to watch the uh, you know them holding the ball. It's smart, you know, because there's no shot clock. It's smart, and I understand that. As, you know, as a coach, you, you value the possessions in in a overtime game, and you you want to hold for one shot. It, it, but just as a fan, and you know, I had a chance to talk to some coaches about this, and the coaches agreed that, you know, when they go to the next level, they have a shot clock, so they want to prepare their players to play under the shot clock, and that's why they would like to see the shot clock in Delaware, uh, most of the coaches. But you know, it, it, I don't think it's coming anytime soon. It's allowed starting next year um, by the NFHS, uh, but I. Just don't see it coming anytime soon. I personally would love to see a shot clock. Well, they might need it after that one. What a game it was, though, between Tower Hill and St. Mark's. Glenn, closing comments on the Hillers and Spartans. Well, the Hillers are obviously very athletic, and they're solid on the wing. Uh, they have good size. The 6'3 Shepherd twins. Uh, Davis Bland, a, a, a nice, tall 6'5 center who can step out and hit the three. I'm not sure who Coach Evans from Seifer will have guard Bland. The injured Tyrese Fortune, he's also 6'5", but his apparent meniscus injury might keep him out of the semifinals. He missed the apple in the St. Andrews games. Supposedly he had an MRI on Friday, uh, but um, we don't know officially what's going on with him yet. The rest of the team are 6'3 or shorter. Ricketts, Bolden, and Wise, they're all 6'2". They play bigger. But uh, I think the six-five center bland might might cause a, a, a little bit of an issue for them. You know, the Blue Jays were our preseason number one, and they have down the stretch now won 13 of 14, and they are peaking at the right time. I know Towers won, I think, seven of their last eight. But uh, two teams that haven't been here in a while. Seifert's only state title was in 97 when Coach Evans was a senior. This is the deepest tournament run they've had since then. And Tower Hill made the program's first Final Four last year. So the program has never won a title game. So I, I, I just think Seifert is too hot right now. I haven't seen Tower Hill in person. I watched the, uh, and it was very boring in all those overtimes, to watch St. Mark's and Tower Hill play uh, on, on the replay when I when I went on and uh, checked the stream out. But uh, I, I just think Seifert might be – too fast for Tower Hill, and if it comes down to a track meet, Tower Hill won't want to play that kind of game. So I think in both semifinals, this one and the other one, it's going to be a contrast of styles and who can dictate the pace. Absolutely agree with that, Glenn. It's going to be interesting to see how both of these matchups, which style we're going to see, which team takes control um, that way. So, Mike, let's might as well finish off here. Glenn, I, you just gave us your pick with Seaford and Tower Hill. Mike, over to you. You've seen you were there at Tower Hill on Saturday. I'm not sure if you had a chance to see Seaford up close and personal yet. Who do you got in that semifinal matchup and why? I think I'm going to go with uh, Seaford. They're just playing very well right now. Uh, I don't think they're going to allow the, the Hillers to slow down the game the way that they did on Saturday, particularly in the overtimes. Uh, just even without fortune, I just think Tower. I mean, um, Seifert just has uh, too much with uh, Wise and, and Ricketts and Bolden and, and those guys. And um, you know, I just think it's. I think there's too much Seifert for for Tower. 
Jay over you here. Seaford and Tower Hill, number 10 versus number 3, a spot in the championship on the line. Uh, and I'm going with uh, Glenn and Mike. I, I think Seaford right now is the hottest team for playing so well. Uh, thing I will point out, I think it's both their both teams' first time playing in the Bob. Um, you know, because Tower Hill made the semis last year, but it was at uh, at Sanford where they, they lost. So, um, you know, I think that that that's even. It's not one team has an advantage over the other. So, um, you know, I, I, right now Seaford is just red hot. Uh, I mean, look what they're scoring. You know, seventy six in their you know, and then yeah. 76, you know, 70. 70. Yeah, so they are scoring some points. Let's now take a look. We had talked about Sally's and Dover. Let's head to the Howard Sanford matchup, a rematch of a phenomenal game earlier in the regular season, and this was a good one coming down to the wire as well between Howard and Sanford round two. Howard number four, Sanford number five, and that's the kind of game we got. Howard able to pull it out 46-41 at home. A nice crowd they had at Howard as well, and the Wildcats able to avenge that early loss against Sanford earlier in the year, Jay. Yeah, and, you know, Sanford executed their game plan. They wanted to keep Howard uh, low scoring again. Um so kudos to Howard to pull pull out a game like that. You know, Howard is a team that likes to score. They like to play fast. Uh, but here, you know, if, when you get in tournaments time, sometimes you have to win these low-scoring games and find a way to do it. And Howard did that. And, you know, playing at home helped. Uh, you know, they lost to Sanford earlier in the year. I think uh, that was on their mind. And they were able to pull it out in the fourth quarter. So kudos to Howard, and, you know, uh, it just shows you that, hey, maybe we can win a lower-scoring type of game. And I've been impressed with Howard all year long, even in that first matchup against Sanford. They've got some they've got some scores and some shooters on that team. We talk about Demir Hollingsworth, Jameer DeShields, um, obviously Rayshon Matthews. They can all shoot the ball. And then Darius Brown does a phenomenal job on the glass and the post work underneath he's able he's one of the most athletic guys in the state as well glenn howard's been good all year long they've been in our top five they get a big win over sanford yeah and, and you know we all know about the players you, that you just mentioned brown and matthews the shields and hollings worth leading the way how about the minutes that boo holland gave them off the bench yeah at the he had six assists i think all late in the game against sanford so I mean, not only do they have those four guys that, that star, but they have some uh, some role players that they can throw into the game. The Pal Twins are both 6'4", and, and I just think what Boo Holland gave them in, in a pressure ball game is going to give him a, a lot of confidence going into that game against Salatiana. Yeah, and what a game that was the first time around as well. So, uh, you know, a rematch in that aspect, one of our Final Four games, Mike. But Howard and Sally's came down to the wire last time, and uh, they'll be seeing each other again this Thursday. Yeah, I think the key for Louisiana is they, they, they can't – I don't think they can run with Howard, so they have to try to – I know they want to run. I don't think they can run with Howard. I think they need to try to, to slow it down a little bit, play a little more of a half-court game, and – um you know, and, and force uh, Howard to play their game. I, I think if, if somebody can establish early that they're going to dictate the pace of play, I think that's going to go a long way to determining the winner. Uh, Howard's got a lot of athletes they can and they, they can glide and, and they're they're all they're good around the rim. So if you can force them to slow it down and maybe shoot more from the outside, I think that's really Sally's best bet. Jay, over to you. Keys to the game for Sally's in Howard. Well, the first time, Sally's had him, Howard right where they wanted to, and then Howard pressed in the fourth quarter, and Sally's turned the ball over, turned the ball over, turned the ball over. We saw him repeat that uh, 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 at the Dover game. Sally's had issues in the fourth quarter when Dover started bringing the press. That's one thing I think Sally's has to do. They have to limit their turnovers against that pressing defense of Howard and play their pace. Um, I think if it's in a tight game, like Glenn said earlier, if they if they have the ball with the chance to, to win the game late, get, get the ball in Justin Mullen's hands and he'll find a way to get it done. But uh, it's going to be an interesting game. Uh, like I said, if Howard can force those turnovers, 
and play their pace, uh, it could be a long life for the South. Glenn, you talked about Holland and the rest of those Howard Wildcats. What are your keys to the game in that matchup for Sally's and Howard? And why don't you get us started with your pick as well, following how you think that one's going to go? Okay. Well, again, and Jay just alluded to it, Justin Mullen's going to get his points. Now, if Howard can really limit him, and he's going to need help anyhow. Isaiah Henson needs to come up big for them. Walsh probably from the outside. When those two met earlier in the year, Henson and Mullen combined for 39 points. And they made seven threes between them. But the Wildcats had five different players that hit from outside for nine threes. But it's going to come down to what Mike said, dictating pace. I think Salesiana can win almost any style. They can win in a... Uh, uh, traditional half court set. They can slow it down that way and be deliberate. They can run with uh, the teams. They did it with Dover and they came out with a win there. But I, I think the key will be what Mike said too is the pace of the game. You, you can't, I don't think they can run 32 minutes in a track meet with Howard and come out successful. So they're going to have to slow it down somewhat. I mean, Howard is going to put the press on, and, and let's face it, their defense is what gives them offense. That pressure defense is is the key to them getting uh, breakaway uh, points. So it's going to be a pace of the game, and I think it's going to be a key in both of those semis. You want my pick, so I get to go first instead of Jay. Yep. So Jay, take a break, <laughs> sit back and listen. I, this is a tough one. This really is a tough one. I think I think if, if Howard's up by, like, Two possessions late in the fourth quarter, they win the ball game. If it's real tight at the end, if it's a one possession game or it's one or two points, Justin Mullen's either going to hit a big shot or he's going to find somebody that's wide open to take that shot, like Walsh or, or Henson. I struggle with this one. I I think Salazi Anum is going to find a way to win this ball game. There you have it. Glenn going with the number one seed to advance in a rematch with Sally's and Howard. Yeah, both of these games are going to be phenomenal games. Mike, over to you. Sally's and Howard, winner and why? Well, I'm, I'm going to go with Slaziana because I don't want to be thrown out of the Alumni Association. <laughs> and uh, the, and also, I think in a rematch, uh, Sally's and their coaches have had some time to look at that game and to see what went wrong and make some adjustments. I know the other teams make adjustments too, but I just think that um, the Slaziana's going to come out and play a smarter game than they, than they did the first time. Um, I just have a feeling that the Sal's, after enduring what they did at the beginning of the season, uh, I just think they're the better team. And uh, I just have a feeling, more than anything else, I have a feeling the Sal's is going to win this one, but it's going to be a dogfight. Jay, take us home here. Sally's and Howard, who's heading to the championship and why? You know how earlier I said I thought the the Caravel Tatlin game could go bonus basketball. Yes. I really think this could go bonus basketball too. And this, with it being the nightcap, uh, I hope people are, uh, can sleep in the next day. <laughs> uh, I think it's gonna be real close. Uh, th I think the key is, uh, like I once said earlier, is, is the pace of play and how it's gonna present itself. Um, I'm going to lean Slazy Adam. I think that schedule at the beginning of the year has helped them, uh, you know, in these close ball games when they were playing some of the tougher teams in the state of Delaware this year. And um, I, I just think Slazy Adam wins a, a close game by a bucket. And how about that? Sally's by a bucket for Jason. So just to recap, your men's semifinal will begin Thursday at 6.30 p.m. is going to be Seaford and Tower Hill getting things started. And then the other Final Four matchup to follow between Sally's and Howard. Tip-off scheduled at 8.10. For the girls, remember, on Wednesday, it's Caravelle and Tattnall at 6.30 p.m. And then Sanford and Ursuline following at 8.10 p.m. Some phenomenal Final Four matchups in both brackets, guys, as we head to the Final Four. And now we'll just close out with some closing words here. Jay, we'll start with you. Just final words as we head to the Bob Carpenter Center. We'll all be there tomorrow night. This has been one of the most exciting tournaments, uh, especially uh, on the boys' side that we've had in a while. Uh, there was a lot of parity uh, this year. I, I know the girls, you still have Caravelle and, and Sanford and Ursuline still there, 
but you had a newcomer like Tattnall. Uh, and, you know, on the boys' side, we have Seaford um, and Tower Hill. So I, I think it, it the parity in both boys and girls this year was incredible. It's good to see some new teams in there, but we've also had some fantastic matchups. It's been a great tournament so far, and I'm expecting more this next four days. Glenn, over to you. Yeah, I agree with Jay. It's, there's been as much parity on the boys' side this year as I can remember, and that uh, is borne out by the fact that uh, every time Jay put the kibosh on somebody ranking them number one, they would go out and next game we must have had seven or eight different number ones throughout this season and and it's borne out in, in what's uh, happened and transpired over the season and in this state tournament then it comes right down to it we have one three and four left and ten so number two didn't make it thanks to st andrews and uh, the c for blue jays are in there um, i think we're in for a great time at the bob it's good really good to go back i'm glad we're going back finally uh, and hopefully uh, COVID is on its way out the door. But I think we're in for a great semifinals on both sides. Boys and girls can't wait to see them. Mike, over to you now. Final words as we wrap up this breakdown of the Final Four for Wednesday and Thursday. You know, I checked the uh, UD ticket site this afternoon, and there were no green dots available on uh, either of the sidelines. And it was low ticket availability in the end zones. Um, so this place is going to be packed on Thursday night. I hope people come out to watch the girls, too, because I really think they're going to be two really good games as well. Um, I'm, it's, I'm excited to get back to the Bob. And uh, that's where these games, that's where they need to be. It's the biggest stage in Delaware, and that's where they should be. And I, I think, especially on the boys' side, it's going to be fantastic uh, this year. I mean, we could have an all-timer as far as, finals go and semifinals uh if you can't if you didn't buy your tickets for the boys yet for the least for the semifinals you got to tune in the nfhs network powered by delaware live and we'll bring the action to you but uh i'm i'm excited and uh you know the final week of the season i'm doing my all-state ballots I'm, I'm thinking basketball i'm excited this is awesome yeah, what an exciting tournament for both sides. And again, if you're at the Bob Carpenter Center, make sure you look way up. We'll be up there in the balcony broadcasting these games, so make sure all of us bring our glasses and or binoculars for these final four matchups for Wednesday and Thursday. That's my final word there. But for Nick Allison, Drini, Jason Winchell, Glenn Frazier, and Mike Lang, it's going to be an exciting Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, to say the least. Make sure you head to the Bob Carpenter Center. Some phenomenal Final four matchups. That'll do it for us for all of us here at Delaware Live Sports.